Good morning, Grace. Today we're going to be looking at the sovereignty of God. Uh, and this is the next attribute of God that we have listed in A.W. Tozer's book, The Attributes of God. Um, you know, I want to get at something right, right away in the beginning. Uh, I want to talk about the issue that most people have with God's sovereignty. Um, most of the time when I've talked to people about uh, the sovereignty of God, uh, believers uh, or unbelievers, um, usually the issue that comes up is how does the sovereignty of God affect uh, human free will or, or so-called free will um, or the ability to make choices or the freedom of the will? You know, how does, how does the sovereignty of God affect that? Um, some people are just confused. Some people would like more information. Other people uh, can be really, really opposed to the idea of God's sovereignty even over salvation. Um, but I would I would point out a couple of things uh, from Revelation chapter one verses four and five. I'm going to read that now. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia: Grace and peace to you from Him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before His throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood. This passage tells us two things. One, Jesus Christ is sovereign. He calls him the ruler of the kings of the earth. Secondly, uh, Jesus Christ frees us, sets us free. So if Jesus Christ sets us free, the meaning is that we were enslaved prior to that. Um, we were enslaved to our sin. Uh, and Jesus is going to, Jesus points this, uh, points to this. I think it's in John chapter eight, but I have the, um, I have the quote uh, a little bit later and we'll get to that. Um, so the Bible does teach the enslavement of the human will prior to salvation, uh, and uh, it does teach the sovereignty of God and the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. So just have that settled in your mind right away, uh, that God is sovereign and that we are not. Um, we do not have an unconstrained will. Uh, and I'll get to that in just a second uh, with the dictionary definition, but you know, my, my goal is not to... Um, my goal is not to uh, embarrass or shame or, or ridicule anybody who thinks differently uh, than, than I do, um, than I think the Bible teaches about the sovereignty of God. But my desire is to help us as a church and anybody else who might be, who might be watching uh, to grow in the knowledge of God. And growing in the knowledge of God, have a greater appreciation, a greater love, a greater adoration, a greater worship of God, uh, and bring him more glory. Uh, and then also that in that, that in that knowledge and in that right response, that we would become more and more like Jesus Christ, which again is for the glory of God. That's my desire. Um, so uh, pray with me now. I hope that's your desire as well, uh, that God would give us understanding, help us to grow in our knowledge of him and our love for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, so much that you reveal yourself to us through the word, specifically and especially through Jesus Christ, through the gospel. Um, Lord, I thank you so much that you do reveal yourself to us, even though you are high and, and wonderful and um, just above our ability to conceive in so many ways, and yet you make yourself known to us. Thank you, God. Um, God, I pray that you would uh, work through this lesson, uh, work through me, uh, and work in all of your, all of your believers um, through this to help us to grow in our knowledge of you to help us to grow in our understanding of you, to help us to grow in our love for you, um, our love for Jesus, help us to grow in our Christ-likeness, and help us to grow in our ability to praise and worship you as you deserve, as you ought to be uh, praised and worshiped. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, so as I like to do, let's start with a definition. Merriam-Webster says these three things uh, that I think that are incredibly important. Um, the second one I'll go ahead and tell you now uh, keeps anybody from being de defined as sovereign. If you take all three of these aspects of the definition uh, in hand, no one is sovereign except God. And it's because of the second definition. But with the first one, we see the supreme power, especially over a body politic or the, the person with the highest power um, or the persons, if it's a, if it's a, a group in a, involved in a government, over any particular place. So usually um, this body politic is going to refer to either a, a defined area uh, or a specific uh, group of people. 
right? So the highest um, authority uh, would be the sovereign authority um, in, a, in a country or in a state or in a city or, or whatever. Uh, secondly, freedom from external control or autonomy. Now, this is the way uh, that a lot of people in their minds, when they think that they have a free will, um, which we are able to make choices, but when they think they have an absolutely free will, this is, I think, the extreme they go to in thinking that they have autonomy, that they have a total freedom from external control, that they can do whatever they want, whatever they will, apart from external forces. Um, and I would argue uh, that that is not, uh, that does not describe the human will. Uh, and we're going to have some verses that are going to help us with that. And then, of course, being the controlling of influence, the supreme controlling influence. And only God is all of these things. Uh, only God has supreme power over everyone and everything, over all that there is. Uh, only God is autonomous, has an autonomous will. And only God is the supreme controlling influence anywhere. Usually when people talk about God's sovereignty, they are referring to the decisive control that God has over all things. Now, even the pagans believe uh, that they're little gods and goddesses or, or groups of goddesses and goddesses have power. But they don't believe, as far as I know, that they have total or unlimited power. Um, and believe it or not, we don't, we don't say that God has completely unlimited power um, and that God can absolutely do anything. Um, but we say it like this. And I, I wanted to use Tozer's quote because I think it was really, really um, probably more concise than I, than I am. He says, God's sovereignty logically implies his absolute freedom to do all that he wills to do. God's sovereignty does not mean that he can do anything, but it means that he can do anything that he wills to do. Now, I'd add also that God doesn't will anything unless it conforms with all of his character. And I think that's important. Uh, A.W. Tozer does point to that, but he specifically puts the will and the sovereignty together in that final statement. But really, I would say it's it's the sovereignty and the character of God. God's sovereignty is constrained by his own character. Um, in other words, the silly question that people ask, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? No, um, God can't do that because that would be completely, uh, well, number one, it would be completely pointless. Number two, um, it would be outside of his character, uh, outside of his nature. Um, so no, God can't. And I think you know it's the same kind of can't, same kind of an idea, although much sillier than the idea that's in the Bible that says that God cannot lie. God cannot tempt uh, to sin, and He cannot be tempted to sin. Um, these are just things that are outside of the character of God. So God can't do them. Um, so when we say that God is sovereign, we mean that He can do anything which is in line with His character, which is in line with His will. And the Bible tells us a number of things about God's sovereignty, but the one thing that I want us to see is that God is sovereign over everyone and everything. God is sovereign over all that transpires and all of creation and everything that has been made and everyone that has been made. God is absolutely sovereign. He gives purpose, he gives meaning, uh, and he ultimately is the judge of all, uh, all other things. So, Genesis chapter 1, God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So we see that God created man with the purpose. Acts 17, 24, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord, think master, right? The one who's in charge, the one who rules, of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples made by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. Again, another purpose. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. So God's not only, only sovereign over mankind in general, and that he started man off in the beginning, but he's sovereign over every single individual who has ever or will ever live. And he's sovereign over all the details of their life, uh, their, 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 where they were born, when they were born, uh, how they would die, and when they would die. All those details, God is sovereignly in control over all of that. Psalm 100, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. God is sovereignly 
in control of us. We belong to him. Jeremiah 18, verse 1. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, uh, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the, but the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord, like clay in the hand of the potter, so you are in my hand. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Psalm 115. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. The Lord does whatever pleases him in the heavens and on the earth, in the seas and all their depths. So, God is in absolute control over everything in the earth, everything on the earth. Uh, God is in total control, including man and including what ultimately happens to man, man's eternal destiny. God is in absolute control. The sovereignty of God. Um, I like this particular um, answer. It is one of the answers to uh, the New City Catechism questions. I think it's question 14, what is God? Um, and the reply is, God is the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything. He is eternal, infinite, and unchangeable in his power and perfection, goodness and glory, wisdom, justice, and truth. Nothing happens except through him and by his will. I hi highlighted and emphasized these two portions, one at the beginning and one at the end, because this shows us the really critical thing that we need to understand about the sovereignty of God. God, because he created and sustains Everything that exists, everyone and everything, he has absolute, He has the highest authority, he has autonomous will, he has full control and influence over everything that exists. Nothing happens. Not one thing happens except through him and by his will. Now, the sovereignty of God, I think, is really important as we think about the sovereignty of God, specifically in connection with the gospel and with salvation. I told you that from the beginning. That's the critical issue, right? Well, in Acts chapter uh, 4, uh, we read from uh, – this is one of Peter's statements. He says, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. So – he doesn't say that Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles were coerced or forced by God to do this thing. He says they wanted to do it. But then he also says that your power and will, God, decided beforehand what should happen. So God has sovereign control over everything, and man also has made choices, right? So it affirms that man can make choices, but it also affirms that over everything, governing everything, is the sovereign uh, will of God. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, um, I've just got a few verses here, but really the whole chapter is awesome uh, and, and points to the sovereignty of God over salvation. But I'll just read these few verses. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Um, so critical, so important. He says, before even the foundation of the earth, God chose uh, us to be saved. He chose us that we would be holy. He chose us in Christ. He chose us to be adopted. And we could just go on and on and on about that opening um, segment in Ephesians chapter 1, about all the things that God has sovereignly chosen to do and accomplished through Christ. But make no mistake, God is sovereign over the gospel. Uh, the sovereignty of God it extends also to Jesus. Um, this is another one of the gospel connections that I think we should see. Uh, in John chapter 6, um, at the end of, um, uh, after, uh, after Jesus talked about being the bread of, of heaven, the true bread of heaven, uh, and many of his disciples uh, abandoned him, he asked his 12 if they were going to abandon him. And Peter answers. I love how Peter speaks first. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Have I not chosen you, 
John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. He says again, you didn't choose me, I chose you. You know, we see in the, in the Gospels that Jesus called the disciples, the, the disciples followed him. And so they might have looked at their lives, and you might have looked at your life and thought, yeah, I heard things and I wanted to believe him, so I, I, I did, you know? And you might think that somehow you had autonomy in that decision. Um, but Jesus says very, very clearly, you know, that no one comes to the Father except by him. And he also says no one comes to, uh, to him unless the Father draws him. Again, we see the sovereignty of God in salvation. Um, Romans 9, uh, really just, I, I would read the whole chapter, but I highlighted some things here that really help us to see the sovereign will of God in salvation. Uh, in Romans 9, starting in verse 11, before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, that is, his choosing power might be shown to be true, his sovereign will would be shown to be true even over salvation, in verse 12, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does the potter not have, uh, and you know, he, he, he's quoting here now uh, back uh, from Jeremiah chapter 18. And so, you know, the potter has the right to do with the clay whatever he wills. Uh, and so it is God's sovereign will that is over everything else that happens, everything that transpires. Um, you know, do we have choices? Yes. Uh, Jacob and Esau made choices in their lives. Pharaoh made choices in his life. Uh, all the all the, all the named and unnamed people who lived in the biblical era, they all made choices. But what Paul is saying here is that it is God's sovereign will which uh, supersedes everything else. It's over everything else. God alone has autonomous will. Human beings, uh, our will is affected by outside forces. Um, and here he says it's in order that we would see that it is God's choosing Right, and so ultimately, so that God gets all the glory, um, and He says, "But is any way is there any way we can read this to say that God is unjust?" And He anticipates the argument, right? Well, if God's sovereign over salvation, many people will say and do say, then He is unjust. But what Paul says here about that argument is no way. It is God's place to give whatever He gives to whoever He gives it. In whatever amounts he wants to, it is his um, prerogative. It belongs to him. Everything belongs to him, so he can give it to whoever he chooses. I think this is really what's going on in the in the parable of the um, the workers in the vineyard. Uh, you know, when when the guys come up at the end and they've you know they've gotten the same pay as the guys who were only working an hour, and he says, you know, am I not free to to give what belongs to me to whoever I want to? It's mine. I can give it to whoever I want to. And, and I think that's something that we need to understand about the sovereignty of God and salvation. He can save whoever he wants to save. It is totally un, um, unconstrained by, uh, by, uh, human, hu human, uh, by humanity. God does what he wants apart from the will or the effort or the desire of humanity. And he says it right here very, very clearly. He says, before either one of them had done anything wrong, so it wasn't in consideration of whatever they would do wrong or right. We see that Jacob and Esau both did wrong things, if you look back at the book of Genesis. Um, but he says it's not, it's not because of that. In verse 16, very, very specifically, it does not depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. He's the potter. We're the clay. He has absolute sovereignty. Uh, I think that there are several things that we need to keep in mind. One, we are volitional. We can make choices. 
we, we do, those choices are limited by a number of things. And even we can recognize that in day-to-day -day life. There's a number of factors, um, things that are beyond our control that limit our ability to make uh, choices and to carry out our will. Um, we're barely able to control the outcome of our will and our choices and our plans. Uh, we see it all the time where we plan poorly, we don't understand well enough, and we plan poorly and we're not able to bring to pass what we wanted to do. Um, uh, you know, we see all sorts of ways that our will is constrained by factors that are beyond our control. God, his will is not constrained by anything because nothing is out of, out of his control or out, outside of his knowledge. Uh, secondly, um, the, the human will is in bondage. Every, the will of every single human being is either in bondage to sin or it is, in, or is, is under the control of, of God through Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, when you look at, um, when you look at the, the New Testament letters, uh, most of the New Testament authors identify themselves as slaves of Christ. They understand that they belong to God. They belong to Jesus Christ because he paid uh, for their sins and he paid for the, the price of their redemption. Um, but Romans 1 explains very, very clearly that the human, human beings are corrupted in every sense of the word. Total depravity is the way that the reformers put it, um, that, that our, our will is affected, our heart is affected, our mind is affected. You know, however you want to, um, and our physical existence is, is, is corrupted uh, by sin, you know, however you want to assign meaning to heart, spirit, mind, whatever, you know, our ability to make choices is controlled, um, uh, controlled by sin. Uh, and then once we submit to, to God through Jesus Christ, our, our, our will is under the control, under the, under the sovereignty, uh, sovereign direction of the Holy Spirit of God. So the human will is always in bondage. Um, it's either in bondage to sin or it's in right bondage to God. Um, so Romans 1 explains the corruption of the human heart and the human will that happened because of sin. Uh, and that as people sin, they grow in their rebellion against God and they grow in their corruption, the corruption of their thinking, the corruption of, corruption of their heart, the corruption of uh, even their bodies. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, I would say, describes the same state of corruption as spiritual death. Thirdly, the thing that we need to remember is that God is volitional, right? God makes choices. But unlike people, God is not constrained by anything outside of himself. That we talked about earlier, God is not constrained by anything other than his perfect character. So God makes choices He's always able to carry them out. He's always able to control the outcome. He possesses all wisdom and knowledge and insight and power, so he's never going to make a choice that he doesn't understand. He understands everything. He's never going to make a choice that he doesn't have the power to carry out because he has all power. So God, unlike man, is unrestricted in his volition, in his ability to make choices, unrestrained by anything or anyone outside of himself, outside of his own will and character. Uh, R.C. Sproul put it um, probably even better than I'll paraphrase him. He says, man has a free will and God has a freer will. I, I, I like that particular quote, even if I've misquoted just slightly. In the end, the truth that God has sovereign control over all things, it doesn't diminish the fact that we have the ability to make choices. It explains that our will is constrained by sin so that apart from Christ, we want to sin. Our will is bound to by sin. Jesus explains this in John 8, 34. You know, he had promised to set uh, people in Israel free, and they're like, We've, we're, not, we're not enslaved to anything. And, and Jesus says, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. The human will is enslaved to sin. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Now he goes on in verse 35 and 36, he says, Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, you do have a choice in front of you. If you are listening to this now and you know that your will has been held captive to sin, that you sin because you want to and you don't see anything that can be done about it, um, then the good news of, of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ is for you, and, and this would be a perfect opportunity 
um, to, to recognize that by submitting your will to the will of God. Uh, Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. He gave up his life to pay for the, the sins uh, of, uh, of, of wicked men and wicked women. Um, and he, uh, when he was on the cross, God placed on him the guilt and the punishment, the consequences of, of all the sin of those who would come in faith and repentance to him of those who he'd ultimately redeem. And, and so, you know, if, if you see that that's a choice in front of you, don't take a fatalistic attitude to the sovereignty of God. Recognize um, that God has given you this choice. He's given you to see, you know, the greatness of the gospel, the greatness of freedom and forgiveness and restoration, an end not only to the consequences of your sin, but to the enslavement of your will to sin. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have a choice in front of you. And I would urge you, choose life. Repent from your sin. Turn away from it. Ask God to free you from your slavery to sin. Jesus Christ died on the cross for, for all those who would come, who would trust in him, who would trust in the gospel, trust in his, his righteous life, trust in his sacrificial atoning uh, death, and trust in his resurrection. And then follow him. You know, so I, I would just I would urge you to not get hung up on trying to figure out how does the sovereignty of God um, and and your free will how does it you know where does it, where does it fit together? I wouldn't even worry about that. Um, like I said earlier, I think R.C. Sproul's quote is just really great. Yeah, we have a free will. We can make choices. Uh, we don't know how many choices we can choose from in every situation, but we we do have the ability to make choices. But God has a freer will. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, then the sovereignty of God, his sovereign election, knowing that um, his choices can never be contradicted, his word can never be nullified or canceled, and that he wouldn't even change it, knowing that your salvation relies on the sovereign will of God is so much greater of a comfort than to think that you're responsible somehow for your own salvation. Choose life. Repent from your sin. Repent from your pretending to be autonomous and submit your will to God's. Follow Jesus. Grace, I hope this has been encouraging for you and uh, anybody else who happened to listen. I hope that we can see you on Sunday at 11 o'clock to worship uh, our sovereign God together. Have a great day.